system of my own, which came to be called personology. So I thought it would be very nice this evening to let you know a little bit about the theory, the system, and how it works, what it does particularly. And that book, Astrolo Fionders, described the 48 weeks of the year. I call them weeks. They're approximately a week long, like the conventional weeks. But it seemed to me even then that the cusp positions, the positions between the signs, were the most important. Because so often people would say, I'm born on June 22nd, I can't figure out whether I'm a Gemini or a Cancer, that kind of thing. And it was only years later, strangely enough, even after I had published these books, that I realized that the four most important points of the year for us, year after year after year, were the longest day, the shortest day, and the two equal days. In other words, the two equinoxes and the two solstices. And when that realization really kicked in, I realized that, of course, they were four of the most important 12 cusps of the year. And I think, looking back on my work in the last 20 years, probably the most important contribution I've made to astrology is to expand the cusps from being a few hours to one day, or at the very most, a day and a half. When I began as an astrologer, those cusps are now solid, week-long phenomena. And because there are 12 of them, that brings a lot of days of the year into play. So maybe one out of every four people you meet in my system is a cusp person. And I want to talk tonight about why the cusps are so important. And as a matter of fact, in my system, why they've taken the place of the signs themselves. So this is all heresy astrologically. Although astrologers are very friendly to me. They seem to enjoy the system. People are buying more of their books and they like that. They find new ideas interesting. But the, the use of the cusp as a phenomenon here on Earth, strictly establishing it not as, for example, what comes in between Libra and Virgo, but rather I'm thinking now that Libra and Virgo are what come in between the cusp of beauty and the cusp of drama and criticism or the cusp of exposure on the other side. So for me, the cusps are earth phenomena. And maybe that's the key to understanding my system, which is that for me, the earth as we experience it here, day after day, year after year, century after century, coming through that grand lengthening of days till the summer solstice, gradually the shortening of days till we get to the longest night and the shortest day on December 21st, that this rhythm that mankind and womankind have been undergoing for the last million years is something that is built into our very DNA and maybe beyond that into our etheric bodies. It's possible that our whole life revolves around that rhythm, that endless rhythm, which is a partial answer to the question of why, when I ask someone's birthday, I only really am asking for the month and the day rather than the year. Because year after year after year, this cycle, this endless lengthening and shortening of days, absolutely predictable, has determined our life here on Earth. Now, where this all started, was a place that you never, ever would have guessed that it started. I was not born an astrologer, and most astrologers I know are self-taught, and they came to it by reading a book by Dane Rudyard or going to a lecture such as this one, and suddenly they realized, hey, anybody can be an astrologer. I don't need a degree to do this. I just need to have a certain kind of feeling for the planets and the stars and the great lights, the luminaries, but what brought me to astrology was something very different, and that simply was birthdays. I grew up in a time when kids collected playing cards, and they collected cards in bubblegum packs. And in those days, you got a few baseball players or basketball players, and you flipped the cards against the wall, and you won the cards, and you had whole collections of cards. And while they were collecting cards, I was collecting birthdays. 
Now, why should a kid be interested in birthdays? I certainly have no connection with astrology whatsoever. I never even heard of astrology growing up in West Philadelphia. But a very strange phenomenon perhaps determined my whole commercial life in that respect as a writer, and that was that my parents were born on the same day of the same year at the same moment. And I was their only child. Same hour also? Yes. So. She was born in Russia, he was born in America, but when the times were translated, it came out to be... Actually, the day is pretty interesting, too. It was January 1st, 1913. Mother, January 1st, 1913. Father, she in Russia, he in America, when the bells were ringing out on New Year's Day. So, Eastern Standard Time. And as I was growing up, it was natural when I was six and seven years old, they felt I was old enough to stay by myself. Maybe I wasn't. I was afraid of all kinds of things like witches in closets. But at any rate, I did stay by myself, and I would sit in front of the TV. We got a TV in 1947, an Admiral 12 and a half inch TV, and I would watch people celebrating on Times Square. It's huge. Uh, celebration, and I knew my parents were out celebrating, so I assumed that they were celebrating their birthday along with everybody else in the world, and that everybody else in the world was born on their birthday. <laughs> I mean, what does a kid know? Why shouldn't they all be born on one day? But I did know that my birthday was May 22nd, so I was, again, the weirdest person in the world because I had a birthday different from everyone else. And gradually I learned that people did have different birthdays, and that was perhaps the beginning of my whole fascination with this subject. Now, my background was primarily, well, on the one hand it was scientific, on the other hand I was an English major, but I did study biochem biochemistry, I went to Yale Medical School to study psychiatry, and while I was there, I was taught by some very eminent psychiatrists, people like Theodore Lids, Fritz Redwick, um, Arnold Gazelle at the Yale Youth uh, the Child Study Center, and um, they all seemed to be convinced that they had the inside track on the human personality and what it was like. But to me, they were missing the point somehow. They were kind of defining very well the psychotic, the neurotic, the borderline personality, the so-called affective disorders, which they spoke about then. And um, I was at a yard sale, and this is, again, how things can determine a life. And by accident, I picked up a book, and it was called Heaven Knows What by Grant Lowy. And Grant Lowy was the foremost popular American astrologer, not like Rudyard. He didn't go into that so much, but he knew an awful lot about people. And in this book, he outlines, you can still buy it, by Llewellyn publishes sun and moon in Aries, sun in Gemini, moon in Cancer, as that was mine. As it turned out later, strangely enough, it was also his, sun in Gemini, moon in Cancer. And as I read this paragraph, because there were 144 of these paragraphs, he seemed to be looking into my soul. He was just describing me as I always felt I was and probably himself too. You receive impressions like a wax plate, give them off volubly. A lot about my background I won't go into, just to say that when I was two years old, they put me in front of a microphone on CBS radio in Philadelphia, and I recited poetry from the age of two until the age of nine. Something like, season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, Conspiring with them how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch leaves run. All of this torrent of memorized, because my mother would read me poetry before I went to bed, and strangely enough, she would read me a poem by Shakespeare or by Keats or Shelley, Byron, and I could say it back. So I'd like to say I was the first version of the tape recorder, <laughs> along with Mozart. And it was that kind of memory. It was just uh, perfect, and it just went on and on and on and on. But I think the, the memory part of it certainly has faded over the years. I have nothing like that kind of memory now. 
but there is a kind of encyclopedic grasp of one subject. Of course, music is something that interests me a great deal, and I spend a lot of time with thinking about the composers. But the one thing that stuck in my mind was their birthdays. For example, when I started getting to know the music of Chopin, the music of Liszt, the music of Debussy, the music of Wagner, I was amazed to find that Chopin was born February 22nd, Wagner, my birthday, May 22nd, Debussy, August 22nd, Liszt, October 22nd, and um, these were some of the composers that I really loved the most, and so I could identify with them. And I found that other people, too, knew someone born on their birthday. Hey, I'm born on Mickey Mantle's birthday. Okay, that was a big deal for a kid who was into, into baseball. So as the other kids collected cards, I began to collect birthdays. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of birthdays, filling books with them, filling uh, what we call agendas with them. So on a certain day, like February 26, instead of writing my appointments in those days when I was 8 or 10 years old, I wrote all the people I could find who were born on February 26. So by the time I wrote that book, Bringing You Up Closer to the Present, Australo Anders for Phil Malson, I had a backlog of probably 10 or 20,000 birthdays. And these were people often who interested me a lot too because I also loved biography. I couldn't get enough of reading about the life of Samuel Johnson or the life of Shelton or the life of Beethoven. And through getting to know these well-known people, I think I was able to penetrate more deeply into the human psyche. It was very traditional at that time for psychologists to collect hundreds and thousands of data and try to make certain uh, assumptions about what they found. That part of their work didn't uh, bother me, but then again, it was so impersonal. There was no real, what we would call Kenneth in Dutch, there was no real understanding of their material. They were only interested in facts and figures, statistical figures. Whereas on the other hand, there were some psychologists, very few, but there were. Abraham Maslow, for example, and Murray, who invented personality, really brought personality out before I made it more popular. And um, some, even some of the teachers at Yale, they found, on the other hand, instead of examining 10,000 or 20,000 kinds of people and building up types from that, they could find out more by investigating the psyche of 10 people, but in real depth, in real detail getting to know them, getting to know them personally and how they would react in certain situations. So after writing Astrologi Anders, Joost Elfers, who is a local, um, Joost does so many things, he's an illustrator, he's a book publisher, book um, designer, grew up here in Amsterdam. He looked at the book and he said, this is the ugliest book I've ever seen, would you like to do a beautiful book with me? And three years later, we published The Secret Language of Birthdays. Now, when The Secret Language of Birthdays was published, I don't know what people thought. In 1994, it wasn't the title of the book that I said they're going to wind up calling it the birthday book anyway. The publisher turned out to be none other than Penguin. And Penguin, of course, is the publisher of classics and novels and great literature and all of that. But I think they realized that where HarperCollins and other companies were moving ahead with the New Age market, all the books, for example, in this room could fall under that category, Penguin had published virtually none in that area. And because Peter Meyer was the CEO of Penguin, and Yoast was his good friend, the deal took 15 minutes. In 15 minutes, we suddenly went from a manuscript to being published by Penguin. And to date, that book has sold 1,300,000 copies. And there has never been an astrology book that's ever published anything like that, except Linda Goodman's book. But our first book was 832 pages. This was a book that was difficult to lift, you know? And um, then we went ahead and did The Secret Language of Relationships and The Secret Language of Destiny. And all this developed very, very naturally. So I thought tonight I would uh, present you a little bit with the system. If you're not familiar with it at all, 
and how it works. And it has very much to do with what I call the grand cycle of life. It's a very simple thing. It's been presented many times before, but I think maybe the way I present it is a little bit unusual. First of all, I want you all to think of this cycle as operating on three levels. First of all, on the celestial level, in which case we have the signs of the zodiac, which you're probably all familiar with in one way or another. The 12 signs, and think of this as operating on the celestial plane. And then on the natural plane, we have the seasons. So here, spring, here, summer, here, fall, and here, winter. And in each one of these areas, remember, I had assembled a lot of data taken from my own personal life, my friends, my family, all the biographies i would read, the psychiatric and psychological studies. And I found that there actually were people who were springtime people and summertime people and fall people and winter people. And each one of them apprehended the world in a very different way. For example, the springtime people were basically starter-uppers, people like me. They're very good to have at the beginning of a project. They may not see it through to completion, and they may have hundreds of projects that they never even finish, but they are the ones who get things going. And then as we move into the summer, the people who were born between the 21st of June and the 23rd of September that is, we can say, between the summer solstice, the long day, and the fall equinox, the equal day. The summertime people are people who want results. They want the fruit off the tree. They want to pick it, and they want to eat it. And they demand that gratification. Leos are very much like that, and Virgos could be like that too. Then moving into the fall, we have the people who are the maintainers. They're the ones who keep things going year after year after year. People like my partner, Leo Stelfers, or like uh, Linda Hill, the Australian astrologer who does the saving symbols, or Suzanne White, uh, the lady who does the uh, Chinese astrology. By the way, they're all born on the same day. My partner, Leo Stelfers, um, Linda Hill, and Suzanne White are all born on the 21st of November. And boy, they're a handful, I'll tell you. These are real revolutionaries. Their cusp is called the cusp of a revolution. They're impossible to handle, I'll tell you. But they're great. I just visited with Linda for two months in, in Australia. We did some seminars together. And then finally, the wintertime people, starting here at the 21st of December, which is the winter solstice, and then moving again to the 21st of March, spring equinox. They are the thinkers. They are the ones who look at everything that's gone before in the year, and they say, hmm, that worked, that didn't work, maybe we'll tweak that a little bit and change it. And they come up with this very considered view of what's been happening. So each one of these quadrants then produces a different kind of person in general, but more important, they correspond to intuition, Feeling, sensation, and thought. It took years for some of these realizations to come to me, but when this one came to me, I realized, of course, it's young. I mean, it's the four methods of apprehending the world through one's intuition, through one's feeling, through one's sensations and through one's mental apparatus, through one's thought. Well, it is Jung's and it's not Jung's because basically what we're talking about, let's face it, is earth, air, fire, and water. And Jung would have to admit, be the first to admit that he was an astrologer in the same way that Isaac Newton was not only a great physicist but a great astrologer too. So basically we're talking here fire, here we're talking air, here we're talking earth, and here we're talking water. 
So, can I interrupt a bit? Yes, because sure. in normal astrology, you have the fire signs, mm -hmm. and they're not in the same month. So I'm Sagittarius on fire, but also uh, April is a fire sign. Sure, you have three fire signs, three air signs, three water signs, but I'm only giving the results of my investigation. In other words, I'm not supporting astrology, I'm not attacking astrology, I'm just trying to give a kind of history of, of how I came up with, with these ideas and where I found correspondences and where I didn't. Now actually, there was something that preceded this in the ground cycle, and that is that this is, on the one hand, the subjective side, the growth of this from here down to here, of this hemisphere, is objective. You see the child growing. By the way, the, the third level, I spoke about the first level as being the celestial, the second level as being the earthly cycle. The third one is the human, of course, which is right in between. So this area becomes ages zero to seven. This becomes age seven to 14. This becomes age 14 to 21. That's one quarter of the human life. The human life is taken to be in my system 84 years. And it just if I offered anything in support of that, it would be one theoretical fact and one actual fact. Theoretical fact, the revolution of Uranus around the sun. Almost exactly 84 years. The Uranus ruling the uh, sign of Aquarius, we being in the age of Aquarius, I would predict with an absolute certainty that the average age of human beings as the years go by will be 84 years. Right now it's the upper level. In other words, two years ago, if you looked at the World Almanac, the longest lived people in the world were French women. They lived to an average of exactly 84 years. But that's the upper level. There are many people who don't live that long. Last year, it became the Japanese woman surpassed that 85 years. So I think as people start living more than 100 years, that average will start to balance out around 84 years. That would be my prediction. That's not too unreasonable. That coupled with the fact of Uranus being so important for the age in which we're in. So having divided the year then in, in half here, growth being objective and orientation being subjective, here orientation being objective and growth being subjective. Hopefully as we get wiser, we get more objective and we're able to move the learning process from being an external thing to an internal thing. Keep in mind the age is 0, 21, 42, which works out very nicely because this is the midlife crisis. This is the crucial area in which Uranus has gone around one half a revolution and Saturn has gone around one and a half revolutions and they're exactly opposite where they were when you were born. And then moving here to we have seven and we have seven, fourteen, twenty-one, and then forty-two, and then sixty-three, and then eighty-four. So this is how I see a human life, but remember we're functioning on three levels. At the same time the human life is progressing, we're moving from one astrological sign to the next, and then finally we are also moving from in the natural sphere of things, one season to the next. Now, the strange thing about personology is that it really, although it sprang from astrology, it no longer is dependent on it at all. As a matter of fact, when I was in Australia, I spoke to the Gold Coast astrologers. I had an audience of 50 professional astrologers. That's it. There was no one there who was not a professional astrologer. It was really wonderful that they all came out. And they were fascinated by this, even when I told them that since this system does not use the houses at all, we get rid of that. We're not talking rising signs or times at which people were born. We're not even interested in the year they were born. We only want to place them in the cycle of the year. Also, we got rid of the signs because actually we're talking about dates. And I urge them to consider that when they're talking about someone that they call an Aries, they're basically talking about someone that's born 
between the 21st of March and the 21st of April, given the day, depending on which system you use. So, in fact, I have phased out the houses. Now I was phasing out the signs in favor of a series of dates, and actually I've, I've renamed all the signs, too. I can tell you what the new names are if you want to hear them. But I thought this would be extremely painful to astrologers, but they loved it. They really enjoyed it because, you know, they've been doing cookbook astrology for a long time. Oh, I have my Venus in Scorpio, poor thing. We all know what you're like. <laughs> and every time it was fitting, sitting in a particular sign. But if you look at one of my books over there, I think the personality book is there, you'll find that when I wrote that book, I was at the point at which I was placing each of the ten planets not in a sign, but in one of my 48 personality periods. So instead of saying that someone had their Venus in Scorpio, I would say they had their Venus on the cusp of revolution, or Venus in the week of death, or Venus in the week of intensity. They would be corresponding to what astrology would call Scorpio Sagittarius cusp, or the uh, Scorpio II or Scorpio I, respectively. But by getting rid of the mythological names of the planets, and the names of the signs, getting rid of the signs, the planets, and the houses, all in one go meant getting rid of astrology. Let's face it, I mean, there's no astrology if there are no houses, no planets, and no signs. What do you have left? And yet, when people read or they're interested about themselves, I'm an Aries, or I'm a Taurus, or I'm a Gemini, all they're talking about is being born between two rather specific dates. For example, the 21st of April and the 21st of May for a Taurus. But I had gone into it from a totally different viewpoint. I was not coming from up here. I was not coming from, you are a Virgo, therefore you are neat and orderly and tidy. Well, there are many people who aren't neat and orderly and tidy who are Virgo, and they resent that. They want something a little more specific. And what I could give them is not what you were supposed to be because you're Mercury ruled and you're this Virgo kind of personality, but rather all I was saying was my investigations show that people born between, let's say, the 24th of August and the 22nd of um, September are like this. And you do it. You read the biographies, you talk to people, you find that group of people born between those two dates, and instead of calling them Virgos, then start to sense not only being born in that month, but being born in one of the five weeks that makes up that month, or being born on one of the seven days that makes up that week. And suddenly we can talk about people born on the 28th of, um, of August the day of language, in the week of the system builders, Goethe's birthday. And by taking 15, 20, or 5,000 people and studying them in depth, we can find certain characteristics that they have in common. Look, I'm not trying to say if two people like my parents were born on the same day that they're the same person. But what I do say is, that if we really examine their personalities, and let's say this might be, I'll just look at this for a second. I, I want to no, leave it there. If we, for example, say this is a human personality, 100%, and we have a number of these overlapping circles, all these people are born on the 28th of August, let's say that 90% of most of them I have found are, are really different, maybe even 95%. But in one area, they all overlap. And all I tried to do when I wrote The Secret Language of Birthdays is neglecting everything that made people different who were born on the same day. What could I tell you about them being the same and being absolutely similar? And all I can, all I can tell you is that that book, has mesmerized 1,300,000 readers, minimal, and that's for the people who own the book, and it's been translated into 15 languages. And they tell me, because I'm not telling them anything, what I have to say is in the book. They tell me that this material is 80 to 90. 
if you look in my book, The Secret Language of Destiny, that whole book is based on the uh, north and south nodes of the moon. So basically, what we come into this life to the tail of the dragon, and where we need to head, um, usually exactly opposite where we come in. So you may come in as a, for example, I come in with Taurus One energy. I love to hang out, love my friends, love to eat, just enjoy all the physical, wonderful things in life. He loves to play. <laughs> yeah, we noticed. But on the other hand, uh, where I need to go is Scorpio One, which is the week of intensity. I've got to learn to really concentrate and not to be going off into tangents and particularly to do my work. And I think that's one reason why I played 32 sonatas of Beethoven at one concert. I'm really a serial person. I'm not a serial murderer. When I sat on lights of plane and played 32 sonatas of Beethoven, that was, that was some event, that was some day. I've done that five times and I've done five Mozart marathons one in uh, the Ravello Festival a couple of years ago. So I love walking through a retrospective of Van Gogh's paintings or a Picasso, a Picasso retrospective. It's a real experience. I wanted to take people through the life of Beethoven, through the life of Mozart, through the life of Schubert, and let them experience what it was like just to walk through that tremendous uh, series of edifices. So when I do Beethoven, you know, I've got to do the Moonlight, the Pathétique, the Moonlight, and all the other ones in between. And by the time I get to the Hammer Club here, which is one of the most god-awful pieces ever written, I must have already played 28 sonatas before that. So it's, uh, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. So sometimes you read light is like people going in a train from Amsterdam to Paris, and some people notice that they're in the train and they get out, and other people stay uh, in one place, and other people move in the train, and but you cannot change the thing that the train is going to, to Paris. Exactly. That's exactly the way I feel. We can spend our time on the train doing more or less what we want, but where we start from and where we end up, I think, is more or less written. There are exceptions. There are powerful people like Beethoven. You know, he was confronted with this idea of fate, Saturn, as we look on it. And he said, I will take fate by the throat. <laughs> now, that was a real Sagittarian, born a few days after you. Tremendous will. But then he's also the man who went on his knees. And when he wrote the A minor quartet, the beautiful A minor League quartet, the third movement is in the Lydian mode from a penitent sufferer to God. He went on his knees before God. When he wrote the Mrs. Solemnus, he was definitely there you know, with God. And he wasn't the top dog either. So he had come a long way from saying, I will take faith by it. But, uh, Anybody else have any comments or questions? Well, I just wanted to know a little more about the December 20th. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we, okay, buy the book. I, I don't have a copy of the birthday book with me, but we have it in Dutch. And I think I call it the day of the projector. People who are able to project their feelings out into the world. Yuri Geller, you know, obviously would take something from that day. But... Um, I don't know what I called it in Dutch. The 20th? The, the Dag van de Generator. The Day of the, the Generator. Generator. Yeah, that's it. Is that your birthday? This, this December 20th. Of course, yeah. yeah. Of course, I know it's your birthday. <coughs> Can you apply that image to your work, being the generator? Mm, well, I'm not sure what a generator is. So. Well, somebody who gets things going and keeps it going. You know, you're the energy source for people. Yes. Of course, I have to talk to them and say, <laughs> is Byron Katie a bit of a generator, too? Yeah. I don't know. But she gets things going and keeps them going, for sure. Yeah, well, I, know, I know you're very close to her, yeah. that's what I mentioned to you. You immediately said yes. Byron Katie is a generator. I mean, we have other spiritual teachers who are definitely not generators and much more inward and working on personal development in a less spectacular way than she does, but 
I mean, she was incarnated as an, an American. It's not her fault, but <laughs> <laughs> you and I were once Americans too, or maybe still are. That special breed person. <laughs> no, I can't, can't judge. And what about relations? What in, what's important to, to take care of? Okay, well now, if you have about 15 days, <laughs> we can talk about relationships. The way I came to write the book was interesting. I came back from one tour, uh, and I had done 11 cities in 10 days. They said this was not possible, so that's why they, they gave it to me to try it, and I did it. It's killing to go on tour for a major book because you have no idea what's involved. They want to get their money's worth. They put you up in the best hotels. On a day like the day I was in Chicago, they say to me, you own Chicago today. That means I'm on the morning news, the afternoon news, and the evening news. It means that I take phoners from 15 different uh, radio stations around the country live in my hotel room to two book signings, a lecture, and then finally at the end of this unbelievably horrible day that started at 5 in the morning, you better not have a headache, they put you on a plane to San Francisco. You get off the plane in San Francisco, you go to the Mark Hopkins, one of the great hotels, but what do you enjoy? You get to bed at 2 in the morning, 5, they wake you up, you're on San Francisco morning news. Ha ha, you know, it's, it's 6 o'clock, the 5th of February, and I must be in Chicago. So I did that. Then I came back and he threw a big lunch, Michael Fragnita did for the whole staff of Penguin. We were celebrating the success of the book and the tour. Then Michael said, well, Gary, what about the next book? I said, next book? I'm so naive. I knew nothing about publishing. Well, the next book, you know, you're going to do a series of books. Oh, okay. So, uh, serial, said, well, what should, yeah, serial. So what should, what, what, should we, what should we do this book on? He said, what was the question you were most asked? on your tour. Mm -hmm. That's what the publisher wants to know. Mm -hmm. I said, well, when they were getting ready to shove me on in front of the TV camera, which incidentally is the most, um, I, I, I can't describe how unnerving this experience is, that they shove you in front of a TV camera, you're being watched by millions of people, they ask you impossible questions, and then after you're destroyed, they drag you off, and everybody has a good laugh. But I. <laughs> Yeah, I handled it all right. I'll tell you about it sometime. <laughs> At any rate, I said, when they were making me up, the girls would always ask, what about my boyfriend? Mm -hmm. What about your boyfriend? Well, tell him he can look up his birthday in the book. No, I don't mean that. I mean me and my boyfriend. <laughs> Relationship. <laughs> well, so what can I tell you about relationships? That's how it started in the beginning. Now, I couldn't match every day with every other day. That would have been impossible. That would have been 366 factorial. Okay. That's too much for anybody. Well, the Fragnito said, we'll, we'll support you for the rest of your life if you do this. <laughs> it's a big book, but we can handle it. I said, what about the 48 personality periods? Aries 1 with Aries 2, Aries 1 with Taurus 5, you know, uh, Taurus 3, um, uh, Aries uh, Taurus cusp with Gemini Cancer cusp. He said, okay, well, if that's what we're going to do, we're going to do it. And how many is that? Well, that turned out to be 1,732. Uh, that's uh, 48 factorial. And 48 plus 47 plus 46. The way it worked is start with Aries 1. Aries 1 with Aries 1. That's the first relationship. In other words, people born between the 25th of uh, March till the 2nd of April with people born in the same week. Then you have Aries 1 with Aries 2, Aries 1 with Aries 3, therefore 48 combinations. Mm -hmm. When you come around the circle, again, you've already done Aries 1 with Aries 2, so you then start with Aries 2 with Aries 3, 47, then 46, then 45. And finally, when I did the last one, it was Pisces 3 with Pisces 3. Ben and Jerry. Would you believe it? Ben, ben and Jerry's ice cream. The two of them are both Pisces 3. Yeah. So how do you write a book on the relationships between people? I couldn't possibly know that many consciously. I collected birthdays, but not relationships. So Yost had a great idea. First of all, to get the photos of these people. 
how do you get a photo of, well, you can get Mickey Mantle with Phil Rizzuto, you know, the shortstop with the center fielder of the New York Yankees team. But how do you know that when you're finished, you're going to have covered all of them? He said, it's very simple. We just take all of the famous relationships in history that we know, we write them down. We'll probably have covered 75% of your categories by that time. And the remaining 25, we'll look for. And we found them all. So we had then some data to go on. I knew a lot of people who were in these combinations. But the, the, the thing that, that really did it for me was doing a sort of psychodrama thing. I would take someone who was a Pisces 3 and someone who was an Aries 2, if that was the one I was working on, and I would put them in my mind in the same room, and I would just see about how they would react as lovers, as a married couple, as family, as friends, and as colleagues at work. So those became the five categories. So in this book, you can look up uh, Aries 2 with Aries 3 in the category of love, for example, and you'll find a couple of sentences on it. And people tell me that this book is just as accurate as the first one. I don't know. I make no claims for my work. I'm only telling you what people write me and tell me. And Look, they're having a good time. So. <laughs> and then also, the, the there's also relations that they're destined to last for long or short or... Oh yes, see. it's all there. I, as a matter of fact, there are many people who have really vociferously argued with me when they were getting married that I was dead wrong about their relationship failing. And ten years later, they wrote me back, you were dead right. <laughs> <laughs> and I, couldn't, I just couldn't realize it then. Yeah, possibly. I, I don't know. I don't know if it has that much of an effect. But um, then the third book, how did we get to that? Well, you remember, um, if you remember your Greek philosophy, often a philosopher will begin defining man or woman in terms of themselves, how they relate in that respect. Then the social area, how they relate to another person. And then finally the third is universal. So if the first was birthdays, you, yourself, the second was your relationship, the third had to be something to do with destiny. And it came to be called the secret language of destiny, the big picture, the language, what you're meant to do in this lifetime, karma, and all the rest of it. So that's how the three books more or less now. Thank you very much, Kevin. My pleasure. Thank you for coming. Give him a big hand.